isn't. It's a case for Nick Carter, master detective. Yes, it's a case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, master detective. <laughs> Concluding the curious adventure called The Accidental Bullet. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Murdered Dog. Investigating the death of a watchdog belonging to Simon Agnew, eccentric inventor, Nick Carter discovers that the dog was accidentally killed when Howard Kent, a gambler, murdered millionaire playboy Danny Cathwell at the 52 Club. Nick is certain that Kent, manager of the club, was only working for a higher up, the mysterious head of a local gambling racket, and he feels sure that when Kent is caught, he will reveal the name of the man behind him. But before Kent can find, be found, Nick and Lieutenant Riley get word from Sergeant Jameson of the state police that Nick's car, stolen by Kent, has been found. It has been hauled out of the river by state police, and in it are the dead bodies of Howard Kent and his assistants. Nick, Riley, and Scubby hurry to the scene. There you are, Mr. Carter. There's your car, just as we dragged it out of the river this morning. Now, where are the bodies that were in it, Sergeant? Right here under the canvas. Yeah. Uh, so that's them, huh? Yes, that's Howard Kent and his assistants, all right. They were both shot through the heart. 32. Yeah. And who do you suppose wanted Kent out of the way, Nick? Can only have been the man behind them, the head of the gambling ring. He's afraid we might catch Kent and don't get a lead back to him. Well, hey, he doesn't stop at anything, does he? Yeah, the murdering scoundrel. Oh, the gambling racket's gotten pretty bad these last few months. If you can nab the man who's running it, you'll sure be doing us a favor. Mm, what is it, Nick? A curious pebble lodged in the tread of the rear tire. Look. Yeah. Well, that probably came from the bed of the river. No, Scubby. If it were a river pebble, the edges would be rounded by the action of the water. But on this one, the edges are quite sharp. And here's another thing. This pebble is blue flint, a type of rock sometimes crushed and used to cover driveways. Hey, wait a minute, Nick. I remember seeing blue gravel on a driveway only this morning. When we drove out to Morton Weston's house. I thought you'd remember, Scubby. Morton Weston? Ah, uh, sure now, Nick. You don't think he's tied up with this case, do you? I'm not so sure, Riley. Oh, I'm afraid you'll run into trouble if you start working on that line, Mr. Carter. Weston is a pretty important man in this county. Besides, he's always been against gambling. I know that, Sergeant. And that might be just a clever way of averting suspicion. Well, now, you, you, you can't go and accuse him of anything just on the evidence of one little pebble now, Nick. I don't intend to, Riley. But the more I think how calm Weston was when I talked to him about his nephew's death, the more I want to pay him another visit. Only this time, I'm going to make a few preparations first. Oh, gosh, Patsy, what do you suppose Nick has been doing in the lab all afternoon? He won't even let me in to talk to him. Me either, Scubby. He's making something. When I offered to help, he said no thanks. Whatever it is, he doesn't want us to know about it. Yeah, I hear somebody talking oh, about me. Nick, you scared me. I didn't need to open the lab door. Gosh, Nick, where did you come from? Why, I've been standing here for several seconds listening to a very interesting conversation. Mm, they say eavesdroppers never hear any good of themselves. I wasn't trying to eavesdrop at you. I was just seeing if I could still move quietly enough to do a little burglary. Burglary? What do you mean? What are you up to now, Nick? I'd rather not say that. In case you're asked, you can honestly say you don't know anything about it. I suppose that means you aren't going to let me go with you. I'm afraid not. But well, what about me? Whatever you're up to, you're going to need some help, aren't you? We might end up in jail, Scubby. Well, some of my best friends are in jail. All right, if you want to take the risk, I'll be glad to have you come along. Oh, well, jail couldn't be any worse than some of the spots we've been in together, Nick. The cellar of the 52 Club, for instance, where we thought we'd been left there to starve. In that case, we might as well get started. It's almost midnight. High time for good burglars to be at work. Oh, Nick, now I know where we're going. Do you, Scubby? Sure, we're heading for Morton Weston's place, aren't we? Right, that's it over there. You can just see it in the moonlight. You mean you're going to burgle his house, Nick? Going to have a try at it, Scubby. You've got to get evidence against him somehow. Oh, stop here. Okay. Pull off the road under those trees. Right, Nick. Well, here we are. Now, what do we do next? Well, for the next half hour, I want you to stay here and wait for me. Wait for you? Oh, Nick, now have a heart after all. If sorry, I... Scubby, sorry. It's going to be difficult enough for me to get into Weston's house alone. You'll be helping me more by waiting here, ready to make a fast getaway if there's any alarm. Well, okay, Nick. I'm going to slip across these fields and approach the house from the rear. 
I don't think I'll have too much trouble opening those French windows in Otis and Weston's library this morning. Well, what's that suitcase you brought along for, Nick? Well, I might be going to use it to carry any incriminating documents I find. Oh, I see. Or I might not. All right, Scubby, this won't take any longer than half hour, I hope. See you later. <laughs> Is that you, Nick? Yes, Scotty. Get the car started. Okay. Let's get going. <coughs> a couple of dogs started barking as I left. Well, did you have any luck, Dick? Not much. I found Weston's safe and got it open, but Weston's apparently too cagey to keep written records. And you took all that risk for nothing? Not entirely. What do you mean? You'll find out later, Scotty. Right now, we've got to get back to town and get some sleep. Because tomorrow morning, we're going to pay another visit to Morton Weston. Another visit? Yes, this time by appointment. Since we can't find any evidence, we'll see if we can't make him give us some. Weston, this is my assistant, Scubby Wilson. Oh, how do you do, Mr. How do you do? Uh, would you gentlemen sit down? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, tell me, Mr. Carter, have you had any luck running down the man who killed my nephew? Not yet, but I hope to put my hands on him shortly. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear that. However, we have located Howard Kent and his assistant, the two men who killed Danny Caswell. They're dead. Dead? But who killed them, Mr. Carter? The same person who was really responsible for the death of your nephew. The man behind Kent. No doubt, the head of the gambling ring. Are you sure he was working for someone, Mr. Carter? I am. And I think I know who it was. Uh, who, Mr. Carter? To cut it short, Weston, you. Well, that's a very interesting conclusion. And may I ask how you reach it? You may. Yesterday, when I told you your nephew, Philip Mansfield, had been shot, you were quite calm about it. Because you knew it already, didn't you? One of your men shot him. Well, uh, I'm afraid you're just guessing. Am I? Then listen. When I made my appointment with your nephew, he promised to keep his door locked and admit no one until I arrived. So? And uh, what of it? But he did admit someone. A thug who killed him. That means the killer must have been sent by someone whose name would cause Philip to let him in. And the only person in this city that he would trust is you, his uncle. Well, that's a very interesting deduction. Oh, uh, go on, please. Somehow, Philip must have let slip he was going to tell me everything. And your thug shot him. I see. Well... As a matter of fact, that's perfectly true. What? You mean you admit it? Why not? Now, sit still, both of you. My men have had you covered for the last five minutes. That's right, Carter. Make a move and it'll be your last. Hey, Nick, two men with guns are covering us from the doorway. So I see, Scully. Apparently, Weston was too smart for us. When your secretary phoned to say you were coming, I decided it was time to put you out of the way, Carter. You've been entirely too persistent in this case. Oh, Jake, keep them covered from behind, Joe. You cover them from the side. Right, boss. Don't worry, boss. We've got the situation in here. Nick, it looks like they've got us. I'm afraid it does, Scully. But we're not out of the way yet. You see this gun, Carter? I was going to dispose of it. But first, it's going to dispose of you. I suppose that's the gun you killed Howard Kent and his assistant with, huh? Exactly. Mm. And after your dead, I'll dissolve the gun and acid. Then the police can search forever without being able to trace the slugs they'll find in your bodies. If they find your bodies. Nick, he needs it. Yes, Gabby, he does. We've come too close to uncovering the mask of respectability he's been hiding behind all these years. Exactly, Carter. You're the first to suspect that I control all the gambling in this county. So, you must go. So, Weston, you admit you're the real owner of the 52 Club, do you? Well, why not? And in killing Danny Caswell, Howard Kent was acting for you. I suppose the law would look at it that way. And you, in turn, killed Kent and his assistant. Had their bodies put in my car and ordered it run to the river. That's also right. Oh, by the way, Joan, I told you to pick a spot where the water was deep. My gosh, boy. Never mind. I, I, I... Now, you do a good job bearing Carter and Wilson, and I'll overlook your blunder. Oh, you can count on me. I know an abandoned gravel quarry where they'll never be found. Now, I think it's time to put an end to talking. Joe. Take this gun. Just a moment, Weston. Yes? Before you do anything more, take a look at the windows there. Why? What? Go, Jake, cop! Hi, Weston. Drop that gun. There, why are you? Scubby, duck! Nick, Weston's hit! Yes, but keep down, Scubby. All right, you two thugs. Put up your hands. Sergeant, look out. I see him, Mr. Cop. I warned him. Go shoot, I give up. You'd better. Grab him in and take him out of the car. Right, Sergeant. All right, you two. Come along here. Your pal is going to wait for the mark. Nick! Nick, are you all right, Nick? Oh, golly, Nick. It's Sergeant Jameson and Riley and a whole squad of state cops. Yes, Captain. I've been expecting that. Oh. You're all right, aren't you, boy? Yes, Riley. A good timing. 
Another minute and you've been too late. Well, we followed your instructions to the dot, Mr. Carter. We gave you just five minutes, then crashed in. Your instructions? Nick, you mean you planned all this? I did. I said that since we couldn't find any evidence, we'd have to make Weston give us some. So I tricked him into doing it. Oh, how is he, Sergeant? Well, he'll live, Mr. Carter, to be tried. And electrocuted. Oh, Sergeant, take a look in that filing cabinet over there. This one? Yes. Why, there's a dictaphone recorder in here. Right. One I planted last night, Sergeant. You'll find Weston's whole admission recorded on it. Glory be, Nick. I say that was smart work. <laughs> I'll say it was. And whoever made that dictaphone is a genius. I never saw one so compact. Friend of mine, Simon Agnew made it. Or at least he made the original. That's one I made after examining his. And that's what you were making in your lab yesterday, Nick. Uh, yes, Scubby. And I had it in that suitcase you were curious about last night when we came out here. Kept it a suitcase because if you'd known about it, you might not have been able to act natural this morning. Well, I'll say I wouldn't. If I'd known we were going to be rescued by a bunch of state cops, I'd have kept turning around to look for them. Gee, Nick, I hate to admit it, but for a while there, I was really scared. I thought this case of a murdered dog was going to wind up by being the case of two dead detectives. You mean, Nick, you tricked him into putting every word of his confession on that record? Yes, Patsy. Now you're up to date on every detail. I haven't left out a thing. So, oh, starting with a dead watchdog, you wound up by trapping the head of the gambling racket. Told you I thought it'd be an interesting experience to investigate the murder of a dog, didn't I? Well, it was. Yeah, a little too interesting, if you ask me. When Simon Agnew regains consciousness, I think he'd be pleased to learn that not only did he start us on the track of that gang, but that he actually wound up the case, too. And now, without that recording device he invented, I never would have been able to pin anything on Weston. That's right, Nick. And now, Patsy, for the next couple of days, I'm counting on you not to let me be disturbed. Why, Nick? Because I'm not going to do anything but loaf for a while. Truth is, now that we've wound up the case of Agnew's murdered watchdog, I'm, uh, brace yourself, dog time. Oh, oh brother. <laughs> so Nick Carter wants to loaf for a while, but he's not going to get the chance. In fact, he's just about to be plunged into the most startling case of his career. The case of the criminal who issued his own currency, bills which could be cashed for a million dollars in any part of the world. Don't fail to listen tomorrow. The Strange Adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, features Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Patsy is played by Helen Choate. The stories are written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, and original music is played by Lou White. Sure to listen tomorrow to a new and thrilling adventure of Nick Carter in the case entitled The Frightened Refugee. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Money Master's Million. <laughs> the Return of Nick Carter, a copyright feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated, is presented by the Mutual Broadcasting System from the studios of WOR New York. The adventures of Nick's adopted son, Chick Carter, boy detective, are broadcast over most of these stations Monday through Friday at 5.15 p.m. Eastern War Time. Nick's own show is presented over most of these stations every evening, Monday through Friday, at quarter past eight Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. <laughs> Thank you.